Uh, my name is Ken Levinson. I'm the Executive Director of WIDA. Um, we are uh, delighted to be joined today by a good friend of WIDA, uh, Stephen Kreskoff, and uh, the, the, the uh, Executive Committee of our board, Sarah Thorne, uh, for this really interesting event to talk about Stephen's new book. Um, I know it, uh, you, you actually debuted the book at the WTO in Geneva uh, last month, but I think uh, uh, this is one of the first public events in Washington to discuss it. Um, I know you had a really good reception there uh, with a lot of people, uh, a lot of visibility with the international trade crowd. Uh, for WIDA, we try to do these uh, sorts of uh, somewhat smaller events uh, periodically um, where people can have a more intimate conversation with the author and uh, uh, some of our other guests around the table. So we are thankful uh, that you could all be here. Uh, we have uh, had a lot of other activities going on at WIDA recently looking at uh, the future of trade. Uh, we have a new project called Next Gen Trade where we're looking at where, we, where do we go from here on trade. Um, I think actually this event in a way is uh, very helpful for that conversation. I don't think we, we didn't brand it as part of the Next Gen series, but it actually does have a lot to do with kind of how we do modern business. And that um, we're going to be looking at, at those kinds of issues going forward with WIDA. As well as the traditional issues, I think we're working on an event for mid-November uh, to look at where we go on CPP when we have a sense after the election of uh, how things turn out and the voter attitudes about trade. Also want a special shout out this morning, um, our videographer, I don't actually always identify those people um, who are helping out, but uh, Miguel Martinez is actually a writer and director of documentaries. He has a film premiering, well I guess it premiered um, already, it's called Farewell Ferris Wheel about um, immigration and the H2B visa issue. Um, he won an award at the Tribeca Film Festival and is uh, premiering at AFI Docs uh, very shortly. So we're thankful for your being here, uh, Miguel. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit, and then we'll turn it over to the author. Thank you. Yeah, so I thought because this is a more intimate group, what would make sense for us to do is, is really kind of have a discussion. And what instead of, you know, I think what we did at the WTO is Steve talked for a while about his book and um, went, you know, went through sort of chapter by chapter, but I think it might be more interesting to kind of have a guided discussion and then because you all are in Washington and you're trade experts, for you to ask questions as well as we hit particular topics. Um, just by way of introduction, you know, I, it's been a long time since I've read a book that I, that wasn't, you know, a beach read. So um, <laughs> doing this forced me to read the book. But the one thing I will say is I wish I'd had this book way back when because, um, you know, the way it's organized and the way that he structures the book is sort of a, a how-to on trade and thinking about all of the complexities and all of the issues and all the things you need to know whether you're a small business or whether you're, let's say you're somebody like I was a couple hundred years ago, coming into learning about trade policy. What are the things that are, what are all of the different things and the complexities that make up an international trade transaction that you need to think about? And then where are the resources and how you do it? And it's structured chapter by chapter by chapter. So if you're, if you're just interested in trade secrets or just interested in corporate social responsibility, you can pick it up and say, okay, what is this? And you know, Rebecca and I were just talking about um, you know, something that happened to our company that we got tangled up in when a Korean ship and company went bankrupt. And it was one of those things that just was so amazing to me because it's a big event, but the issues that you're dealing with are really at the micro level. Okay, I have, I have product in China in a terminal. Not really mine, because I take it freight on board. How do I move that? Oh my goodness, the, the ships got here and they unloaded, but I don't own the shipping containers. How do they get back? You know, these, the trade is, is, is at this basis a very complex um, international, and there's so many people who touch every aspect of a trade transaction. And I think it's really helpful to have that in one space, because the one thing I'll say, um, and then I'll turn it over, is you know, as we've tried to incorporate more small businesses into our supply chain, it's, there's a knowledge deficit of what you need to become part of a global value chain. People say, I make this and I want to sell it to Walmart. Well, do you have a barcode? Do you, do you understand how you're going to get trade financing to actually ship your product to liability insurance? Did you think about how many you're going to need to sell to us here? So in some ways, we always say that the international transaction is actually the hardest thing. 
you may want to sell to us locally first, understand our business model, get some scale, and then sell to us. But having, you know, breaking down that knowledge deficit and talking about what trade is, especially when it's been so demonized and so demagogued over the last couple of years, um, is really, really helpful. So with that in mind, I thought I'd ask you some questions. So Absolutely. I've given you my take on the book. Why did you write the book? Well, thank you for uh, introducing me, Sarah. And uh, I wrote the book because I felt uh, no one had written a book like this, particularly one that was uh, up to date in terms of uh, trade issues. As specialists, we tend to get siloed into our specialty area, and I have had a career as a, initially as a trade lawyer, and then more recently as an international consultant working for the World Bank and U.S. government and other governments advising developing countries. But I've also been an uh, international business person, uh, including a director of a metals and minerals co uh, company. So it's just a function of having a long life, I guess, which mm -hmm. is good. Um, and uh, I've, so I've seen trade from a lot of different perspectives. I felt there was a, a, a need for a book like this that was an overall guide, particularly for uh, smaller businesses in the United States. There's something like 30 million small businesses in the United States, and they're all uh, services, businesses, or businesses involved with goods, and they're all one way or another involved, in my opinion, with international trade, but they don't necessarily know it. Uh, I was just showing uh, uh, Sarah some statistics I pulled out of uh, the publication uh, of the, the World Bank. Um, the, uh, if we look at trade in goods and services as a percentage of GDP, uh, for, the United, for the United States, that's 28%. Uh, for uh, an economy like Singapore, it's uh, 326%. And even uh, for the European Union, it's 83%. So of all the developed uh, economies in the world, uh, the U.S. is less integ integrated into the global, global economy than any other economy. And even with developing economies, only Brazil is kind of in the range of the United States. So why is that? I think uh, my thesis is that it's because uh, many of our small businesses are not attuned to the, to the global market. They don't realize they're functioning in a global market. They don't realize they have opportunities in the global market. So, you know, this is why I, I wrote the book. Yeah, I think it also would be useful uh, to academic institutions and to large uh, firms like uh, Walmart. And by the way, thank you uh, for Walmart selling that book. Um, it's available on Amazon and uh, uh, Barnes and Noble and, and other outlets as well. Uh, so th that's that's why I wrote it, and it was it was actually fun to write it because uh, um, I. It, it allowed me to kind of review my career, and in the final chapter, I actually include anecdotes from my, uh, my career, personal experiences that relate to some of the topics in the book and some of my war stories. When I originally uh, wrote the book, I intended to include them all in the appropriate chapters, but then my readers, some of my readers said no, you know, separate it out because not everyone wants to hear about, you know. <laughs> what you did in Timbuktu. Um, so that's why I wrote it. Good. And I think you've answered this, but, but primarily, who, who's it intended for? Mainly smaller businesses. Um, and because I'm uh, a U.S. person and I'm a U.S. small business. By the way, uh, I said this at, uh, in Geneva at the WTO book launch. Uh, I'm uh, the smallest uh, business in the world. One and Walmart is the largest <laughs> in terms of uh, number of employees and uh, and annual sales. I think I'd like to approach a little bit more of the Walmart <laughs> status maybe in the future. Uh, so we really range uh, the spectrum here in, in terms of perspective, and I I, th I think it'll be fun talking to you guys this morning about uh, our experience and our insights. About international trade. I do want to spend a little time, uh, since uh, we have an election in a few days, talking about some of the, uh, what I consider to be misinformation about international trade that has been uh, spread by by politicians, but we'll get to that uh, in a bit. All right, so let's do a quick... It's sort of like a dessert. Yeah. 
overview. Yeah, we have to, we Let's have do a quick overview. Vegetables. So, what what kind of what what questions were you trying to answer in the book? Well, first of all, uh, I think a lot of um, small businesses don't realize they're functioning in a global economy, whether they like it or not. So I, 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 I have my initial chapter devoted to answering why they should be concerned and interested in uh, international trade. And it was a lot. It was fun to write because I, I did a, uh, uh, a history of the development of international trade from ancient times to to the present, and in about 30 pages, kind of a condensed history. And I love history, so it was it was, it was fun to do. Uh, and those of you who like history will probably enjoy uh, reading it also. So the, the point of the first chapter is to convince skeptics, small business people, that they are in fact part of the global economy whether they like it or not, and you get, get with the program and start thinking about the global market. Uh, so, so then uh, uh, briefly in succession, uh, I have a chapter on, uh, well, how do you get customers and clients in the global economy? You know, this is <laughs> if you're going to function in the global economy. Uh, one of the uh, in, intriguing uh, issues related to that uh, is uh, cultural difference. Cultural differences, and I've uh, working around the world. I've had a lot of experiences that highlight cultural differences, that problems that uh, American businesses have functioning in the global economy. Uh, Earlier uh, this year, I uh, was fortunate to uh, uh, do some consulting work in Myanmar, and work at all. And I was there for two months. And at every meeting I had, and there were many meetings. Uh, the meeting would always start with someone bringing uh, coffee, tea, and pastry. Although I didn't ask for anything, so I asked, you know, why are you doing this? Well, the answer was that uh, that people, the Burmese people are so polite that if you ask them, they would always say they didn't want anything, even though they were dying for a cup of tea or coffee. So to preempt that, we just bring the refreshments and we, uh, and we understand you know, that people may want it. Uh, a little bit later, I, uh, as uh, Aaron knows, I, I did some work in the Philippines. And I was, uh, hadn't been there in about uh, 25 years. It was interesting to see the developments. It was right in the middle of the presidential election. I left right before uh, Duterte was elected president. Uh, and it, it just amazed me how um, family-oriented everyone is in that culture. Family is everything, and I know you're nodding because that's true in other cultures as well. I've worked in Nigeria, for example, where it's, uh, you know, um, uh, family and, and uh, ethnic group is critical. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's really unlike the U.S. Um, in the U.S., we're very individualistic. We say the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know, we expect people to speak up. Uh, in Japan, uh, I know we have someone who's uh, from Japan here, uh, the approach is the opposite. They're saying is their aphorism is uh, the nail that sticks up is hammered down. Uh, the goose that honks is shot. <laughs> so, so you can see how there could be a cultural uh, clash there uh, if there's unawareness. Uh, I had a uh, uh, Chinese business friend tell me once that Americans are glass people. And Aaron is a, uh, speaks Mandarin, is an expert in uh, uh, Chinese affairs. Uh, it's, that was not a compliment. Uh, they meant that we show our emotions, and this is not something that is necessarily acceptable in the East Asian society. Uh, and uh, you may, people may tell you yes when they really mean maybe, or maybe you <coughs> no, you know, just to be polite. So uh, cultural issues are, in, in terms of uh, finding customers and clients, are really important, and, and I outline uh, a number of other factors that uh, we have to look at. I think really an important thing to emphasize is that we're in a new world today. It's a world of cross-border e-commerce. So it makes it much, much easier for small businesses to participate in the global economy. And I know that you're probably finding that also, uh, Sarah, in terms of your uh, <laughs> supply chains. And they can uh, participate uh, on a B2B basis with uh, firms like Walmart or on a B2C basis through portals like uh, Amazon or Alibaba in China. Uh, uh, this is what's happening uh, where trade is really expanding 
and we'll, we're seeing more traditional trade in goods and maybe even in services uh, slow, whereas cross-border e-commerce is, is, is ramping up. Um, how do you get paid? This is another issue that uh, has been of concern to me as a consultant lawyer from time to time when I've foolishly provided on, uh, on particularly an in international business on a uh, client being excited to have the work, they're nice people and so forth. So you, you, you don't take the time to have a clear uh, written agreement as to what's expected from each side and you don't have provide for reasonable dispute resolution, which in my opinion should be some sort of uh, uh, arbitration or mediation and not uh, litigation in the na national court. So, um, and, and of course, if you're, if you both with respect to uh, selling goods or selling services, there are a lot of measures you can take to protect your financial position. Uh, using trade finance, for example, selling goods uh, or uh, selling services, you can, you can uh, have uh, your service agreement uh, broken up into segments so that you know, a payment has to be made for each segment uh, with uh, frequent consultation because lack of communication is a killer in terms of uh, business relationships. So I tell a lot of stories about that, how I learned the hard way and how I put uh, that principle to work when I had a very difficult project about 10 or 12 years ago in Moscow uh, working with the Russians, uh, which reminds me of another cultural difference that I ran across uh, working with the, with the Russians. Uh, when, when I started the World Bank project in Moscow, we had an initial meeting, uh, and it was like something out of the Cold War with the Russians on one side of the table and we were on the other side of the table. And when we got to a discussion of WTO accession, uh, the leader of the Russian delegation kind of puffed up and started screaming that uh, she had no interest in the WTO. And, you know, we shouldn't spend any time on that and so forth. So I looked at my uh, uh, World Bank colleague in dismay because this was part of the contract. This is what we were supposed to be doing, and the World Bank was financing the uh, underwriting the the project. Well, there were political problems in Russia at the time, but actually what this illustrated was, was uh, uh, kind of Russian culture and Russian management approach of, uh, be, I'll call it being the czar, which entails doing a lot of screaming and foot pounding and so forth. And I, uh, I do speak some Russian. I saw a, a, a very amusing uh, Russian movie called, uh, in, in Russian, Ivan Grozny, and in English it's uh, Ivan the Terrible. Uh, the comedy made in the late Soviet days, uh, and I won't bore you with the details, but uh, the message that I derived from it was that uh, in order to be a czar, you have to, in other words, the leader and the boss, you have to threaten people with execution <laughs> and yell at them. I mean, this is Russian culture. Uh, so so I, the light went on and I said, okay, you know, I'm not taking this as personally, this is just, just their culture. Um, so I've had uh, a lot of interesting experiences uh, like that in terms of cultural differences. Working in Kazakhstan, the first time I saw this great big bill bar board with uh, advertising a cleanser, and the name of the cleanser was BARF, B-A-R-F. <laughs> so I thought, you know, this is not going to work too well. This is not going to translate too well in an English-speaking country. So there, there are innumerable um, uh, um, issues that uh, uh, particularly American small business people need to worry about in terms of cultural differences. And, I, and Sarah, I think Walmart has run into this in terms of the uh, countries that you've tried to do business in. I don't yeah, know to what extent you want. Mess, but uh, what we extent did you want to open that. stores in Germany, and we had our greeters in the front, and the greeters would, you know, hi, welcome to Walmart. And the Germans were like, well, stop. <laughs> <laughs> You're freaking me out. Um, and I do think we've had to learn very quickly how to localize and how to localize stores, especially on, um, you know, what people don't realize about Walmart is around the world we're largely a grocer. And food is so culturally and so locally relevant that, you know, it's you, we are constantly working between what we call leverage and localization. So how do you stay locally relevant? 
but then how do you maximize and reduce trans transaction costs by figuring out what, what can you sell everywhere? Um, and, then, and then how do you put those two together in a way that delivers on a promise of, of giving people what they need at the price that they need? So, you know, I wanted to just move you on to, you know, a lot of the book talks about um, what are the most important um, legal issues for small businesses. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you approach those legal issues? Well, that, yes, that's a good segue because 80% uh, of the U.S. economy is uh, uh, services. We're basically a service economy, so if you're involved with uh, international business like me, you're, you're providing a, a service. Um, and uh, a lot of our services uh, relate to high technology. Um, or there's, there are a meld of products and services that involve high technology. So, uh, and, uh, protecting intellectual property is is uh, critical. How you know how you do that? You have you have to evaluate what your first what your intellectual property is. Uh, do an assessment of that. So small businesses should think about that. Obviously, if they have a patent, that's obvious. But people forget about business secrets and. Um, uh, how you protect business uh, secrets is, uh, can be critical. Uh, Coca-Cola, of course, has a very important business secret that they've had for over 100 years that they've managed to, to, uh, to protect. So particularly for uh, American businesses, protection of intellectual property is, is key. Um, after you uh, identify what you have, then you have to protect it locally in the local economy appropriately, and then there are measures you can uh, take uh, when you sell abroad. And in fact, when you're assessing where you sell abroad, um, the protection or lack of protection of intellectual property is, is really relevant. Now, I have a, a client that manufactures uh, fencing equipment that uh, they sell in more than 60 countries around the world, but they won't do business in China uh, they don't have a patent, they have business secrets, uh, they just don't want their uh, product to be re reverse engineered in China and then, uh, and, um, and then have a Chinese competitor. So uh, China, unfortunately, in the past has been notorious for poor intellectual property protection. Hopefully that will improve in the future as the economy evolves in China. But uh, realistically, uh, as a small business, you have to look at, you know, where your potential customers and clients are located and, and assess uh, the likelihood of protection of your intellectual property. And in some uh, economies, you may just not want to take the chance. Good. And, um, you know, I was impressed that you, you have a whole chapter on business social responsibility and the importance for every business, regardless of the size, to focus on this issue. And I'll, you know, for Walmart, I think increasingly in the in the era of I would call it sort of intense transparency. Everybody has a smartphone and everybody has access to Twitter and everybody has access to um, to social media. You know, we are being increasingly asked to be accountable for everything and everywhere in our supply chain, even if it's not a direct supplier. So it's not just even the factory that is selling the product to us, it's what's happening behind the factory. Or if you're buying seafood, what's happening behind the fact that they're catching shrimp or, or raising shrimp? You know, what's happening to the people on the boats that are that are actually picking up the chum to make into the fish meal, to feed to the fish in the fish farms that you may then later buy at a processing factory. And this is absolutely what's happening to us as a business in that there's an expectation that we should have control over those supply chains, and everybody within that supply chain should be treated with dignity, um, and all labor laws and all laws should be upheld, and if the government isn't doing it, then the private sector should do that. Fair or not, that's essentially what's being asked of us. Um, and so as a result, we're saying now, you know, it's a lot easier if we make sure that people coming into our supply chain are good businesses, so that we're not going back and having to correct bad practices. So, you know, this is, you see it in our supplier standards, you see it in the way our suppliers are going back into their chain and saying, you know what, we're going to need sort of a chain of custody, we're going to make sure we have visibility, there are new laws. 
So how does the small business then take that on if you're all of a sudden, you know, these, these add costs to a transaction. So why should we do this and do businesses have to have social responsibility built in? Well, there are, uh, of course, there's a, uh, in addition to assessing uh, impact of the business on stakeholders like Walmart is doing, there's also uh, the possibility that you, uh, that social responsibility will actually add value to your product or service. And a classic example, of course, is uh, Ben & Jerry's ice cream, which some of us, including me, really love. Uh, I'll, I'll send you the bill later, <laughs> Ben & Jerry's. Um, that, that, all, that started out really uh, making social responsibility part of their product. Um, there, there are others like uh, Whole Foods uh, uh, does that. Uh, quite a few other businesses uh, affirm, affirmatively uh, 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 incorporate social responsibility in the, in the product or the service they're offering. So it's not just playing defense, it's actually playing offense and, uh, and, and having a product that uh, is attractive to consumers because of being socially responsible. And millennials and others are, are really concerned about these issues. So it's, it's something that businesses have to be aware of today. Now, going back to the 1960s, I think it was, Milton Friedman, the Chicago economist, famously said that uh, the only social responsibility a business has is to its stockholders. <laughs> but that was, maybe that was the philosophy in, um, in the 1960s, but it's, it's just not applicable uh, in um, the modern day. And uh, even the smallest of businesses needs to consider uh, their impact on stakeholders and the possibility of using social responsibility uh, as a, you know, a feature of their product or service. Great. Um, and I think this is something we can get into a little bit more in the discussion. Um, one, I want to do a couple more things. You talk about the trends that you're seeing that will affect trade, and then we'll talk, then we'll transition to some of the misperceptions that we're hearing yeah. in the rhetoric. Well, the, uh, chapter eight of the book talks about kind of the near future of trade. I can't predict out more than five years or so. Uh, but And I do kind of a David Letterman. You know, I, I do it in reverse from the least important to the most important. So I think probably the least important uh, uh, impact to me will be more regional uh, trade agreements, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or, a Taurus and uh, TTIP uh, 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 trade and investment partnership with the European Union, or what's left of the European Union. Um, so, and 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 maybe uh, I'm not discussed in the book because Brexit happened after the book was published, but uh, maybe a uh, bilateral trade agreement between the United States and the UK. I can certainly see that coming uh, after uh, the UK exits. Uh, the European Union. I think um, I think we'll have these agreements in some form. Um, uh, as far as uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, maybe not the form that we have it currently. Maybe there'll be some renegotiation. I, I, I think of uh, what happened with the U.S.-Korea agreement, where there was the Obama opposed U.S.-Korea, and then there was a renegotiation, and ultimately uh, an agreement. So I think, but I, overall, I think these will have the least impact on uh, trade in the next five years. Um, uh, after that, I think uh, we have the continuing emergence of China and India. Uh, India is now growing faster than, than China. China is <coughs> retrenching and looking more inward. Uh, but both these economies continue to grow and uh, will have an impact over the next five years. There will be more trade in goods and goods. Uh, China is mainly focused on trade and goods. India is more trade and services. Um, and India is not that well integrated in the international trade at this point, so I ex expect that to change over time. Um, thirdly, I think we're, we're going to have new technologies. Uh, uh, 3D print, imagine the impact of 3D printing as it ramps up in robotics. So 3D printing may fundamentally change the nature of trade in goods because companies like Walmart, you know, if they, if they uh, need a product may just be able to print it, you may be able to, uh, and, and, and then 
how do um, and Aaron, how do these the developing countries uh, that rely on customs revenues uh, continue to collect customs revenues if you can just uh, send a product electronically and print it in the country of destination. It's going to be a wonderful new world. Um, uh, um, of course, drones and uh, Amazon is now exploring the delivery of uh, small packages using drones. I don't know what that's going to mean to brick and mortar stores. That's something that Walmart will have to think about. Maybe there'll maybe be a Walmart drone department before long. Who knows? Uh, so, but then the last two, I think, are going to be the most important. Um, uh, more complex global supply chains uh, because, of, because of our new technologies and because uh, our trade transaction costs are, have, have really come down. Uh, so that will allow small businesses to participate in very complex uh, global supply chains. So uh, Apple, for example, or Boeing, or Walmart, uh, have thousands and thousands of suppliers from all over the world, and uh, can vary these suppliers depending on uh, uh, business conditions, uh, cost, and uh, uh, logistics issues, and so forth. So uh, this, will, this is a trend that will, uh, will continue. But I think the most important uh, trend that I'm seeing is cross-border e-commerce or uh, and, and also cross-border data flows. Um, I, I think that's ramping up quickly. Uh, when I was at the World Trade Organization last month, I was talking to the economists there. there we're, this is something that we're, we don't have good data on. We're not tracking well uh, because we're always, it's like the military, we're always fighting the last war. And, and this is happening under our nose uh, very quickly. So we, we see people are, are seeing that um, the statistics showing trade in goods seem to have stagnated or maybe even the sloping down. Now, why is that? It's because of cross-border e-commerce, in my opinion, because that's moving up very quickly and uh, becoming important, and it will be really important over the next five years. So this is where our policy people should be uh, focusing. Um, um, how to encourage uh, cross-border e-commerce consistent with, uh, with national policy and with uh, uh, the principles of uh, the WTO. You can tell that to Europeans. Uh, well, there, you know, <laughs> I, I, I did mention the Maginot line to them the other day. <laughs> so, okay, let's talk about the election, and I think we all know that trade has become, you know, the, a really easy scapegoat for people. The other, it's not, you know, I lost my job, not because of what, productivity gains or technology, but because of trade. Is that true? Uh, it's an easy scapegoat, and, and it, it reminds me of the, uh, the wonderful Mark Twain quote that there's uh, liars, damn liars, and statistics. <laughs> statistics being the one that you know, can be the greatest falsehood, depending on how you use it. And I'm, I really have been dismayed that some of our politicians have focused uh, on, on trade with China and trade with Mexico. and, and, and claim that, uh, that that trade is really adversely affecting uh, the American economy, because I don't think that's correct. For, uh, well, first of all, as I mentioned before, uh, we're primarily a services economy. Eighty percent of our uh, economic activity relates to services, and if you look at trade and services, we're uh, by far the largest exporter of services in the world, the United States is. And we run a very large uh, trade surplus in services. I think in 2015 there was something like a $262 billion surplus. And have you ever heard a politician mention that? No. Uh, so that's the first point. The second point is um, I uh, put my <coughs> oldest son through college basically on uh, fees from a country of origin uh, law case that I've worked on for <laughs> Rebecca probably remembers that uh, uh, 20, 25 years ago. Uh, our uh, 
country of origin law uh, says that wherever the last substantial transformation takes place, that's the country of origin. Well, in the case of my uh, Apple iPhone, that's China because the iPhone was assembled in China. But how much of that iPhone really is of Chinese value or origin? Probably, uh, uh, I was at uh, Brookings uh, program Wednesday and someone said it's only six or seven dollars uh, that, uh, that China contributes to the, uh, just, you know, the assembly operation that China contributes and the other parts and components um, uh, come from other countries including the United States. So uh, our law is, you know, was appropriate for the 19th century but not for the 21st century. We're collecting data that doesn't really uh, reflect the complexity of uh, supply chains today. And I think that needs to change. I think we need to tell our policymakers, let's, let's start collecting data that reflects the real economic reality that's, that, that's going on. Mexico is an even worse situation because they're uh, 40, something like 40 percent of the value of Me Mexican imports relates to components from the United States. And there again, um, because there's been a sub substantial transformation in Mexico, the entire value of the import is attributed to Mexico, so we look like we're running a, a, a trade deficit, but uh, if you look at the, uh, um, the supply chain situation, it's not, that's not at all clear. I'm not saying that um, the U.S. isn't running a trade deficit in goods. We are, but um, uh, I think it's a mistake to focus uh, just on uh, China and, and Mexico. Uh, and then, of course, we have the issue of what do these countries, uh, take, take China, for example, what does China do with the uh, uh, trade surplus in goods? Do they put the money in a mattress? I don't think so. But what they're doing is they're buying uh, uh, treasury securities and they're investing in the United States. I don't know what, how many of you saw the Washington Post yesterday, but there was a front page article about a Chinese investor opening up a, uh, a closed manufacturing facility in Ohio uh, to manufacture, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, window glass for automobiles. So that money is, and, and if you talk to your uh, local real estate broker, they'll probably tell you about Chinese investors buying local real estate. So that money is coming back in the U.S., uh, giving us low interest rates and providing jobs in the U.S., so it's being recycled. That's not to say that uh, there aren't uh, some uh, industries that are being adversely impacted by uh, both changes in technology and by, uh, by trade, but uh, uh, the solution to that is not to turn the clock back, but to, uh, to take care of workers who are displaced in an inhumane way. Uh, we haven't been doing that, uh, so our policy makers, in my opinion, really need to focus on that. And the last thing I'll say about uh, trade is, from my, from my experience, I've seen a real change in the world uh, in countries like China, uh, Russia, Vietnam, that used to be uh, adversaries of the United States that are now, uh, uh, we have our differences, uh, but there's no real danger of uh, military conflict. And the reason is because of strong economic ties and international trade. So international trade uh, has been very beneficial for geopolitical reasons, and uh, that the politicians don't seem to mention either. There's a wonderful story uh, about the start of the American Civil War, and President Lincoln was talking with the uh, president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, because the Pennsylvania Railroad owned the tracks and the telegraph lines, and the Union needed to, to uh, take over the, those facilities for the war. And they were looking at a map of the, of, uh, the rail map of the United States, and uh, Lincoln commented uh, that uh, it was really amazing all the lines ran east-west, there were no lines running north-south, so the uh, president of the Pennsylvania Railroad said, well, Mr. President, if they'd run north-south, there would have been no war. <laughs> so, and that, I think that's true of international trade in general. I think that's a good place to stop and take some questions from the audience and your comments as well and your thoughts and open it up. I uh, 
Um, my name is Sharifa Crawford. I'm an analyst at the International Trade Commission. Uh, thank you so much for coming to speak to us about your book. And, and thank you. Uh, thank, uh, I'd like to thank the International Trade Commission for your good work on cross-border e-commerce. Been doing. Okay. Uh, my question was um, understanding that there are 30 million small businesses in the United States, and uh, that only five percent of the world population actually lives in the United States. What would you suggest um, be the first order of business for a small business that wants to go global? Because I know, like medium-sized businesses, they have the resources to hire like a trade. Uh, compliance person, but for a small business, would you suggest that they have a business development person that expands into being the trade person for the time being, or what would be your first suggestion? I, I, I don't think it uh, is that complicated. I think that uh, I think really small businesses, uh, and we're generally talking about service services too, uh, uh, need to evaluate their their product or their service for the global market. Uh, so you can compete by having. Uh, a standard product or service, uh, and you're competing based on price. Or you can have something that's more or less unique uh, that uh, competes based on the uniqueness of the product. So, I mean, the first step is uh, you know understand what you, what you're selling uh, and its suitability for the global market, and uh, either based on price or based on uniqueness. Uh, and then uh, once you've done that. Um, uh, then I think it's appropriate to start thinking about how you're going to sell and uh, cross-border e-commerce greatly simplifies that because now with uh, platforms like Amazon and Alibaba, uh, you can just, you can, uh, or eBay, uh, you can uh, list uh, on those uh, platforms and uh, start selling anywhere in the world. But uh, going beyond that, um, there are uh, U.S. government and state programs that help uh, primarily focus on uh, uh, you know, promoting exports of goods, I think, but uh, can be very helpful. Thank and you. I've discussed those in the book. Other questions, comments, thoughts? I have a, I, I'm going to get someone to have one. Oh, please, no, no. Okay. Hi, Susan Zimmerman from UPS. I just wanted to follow up on your question. Uh, you mentioned corporate responsibility, um, particularly on the sourcing and labor side, but I wonder if in your research you came up with anything regarding the responsibility of particularly large businesses who do have the know-how and the capacity um, to navigate international trade and the responsibility they might have to businesses that are trying to link into the global value chain and um, either directly or and how they might influence the international regulatory environment, make it easier? I think I'll let Sarah <laughs> answer that. <laughs> well, you know, I think, and we, UPS and, and Walmart, we share common, um, common goals in this, which is, you know, one of the things we see around the world is we are so big we can navigate the barriers to trade. Um, but a lot of the trade friction we see are actually at the border. It's, it's really trade facilitation issues. They are lack of data. Uh, okay, what are your rules? Could somebody just tell me what the rules are? Um, how long does it take to cross that border? Because it's great if I can, you know, the internet is a wonderful thing, but you still gotta move the stuff. And if you cannot move your stuff, you, you cannot make a trade transaction. Um, so one of the things we've been working together with UPS, with DHL, with FedEx, is something called the Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, which is a public-private partnership, to say, we know the private sector, what the barriers are, because we're there every day doing it. Um, how do we translate that into good programs and projects in country to help countries who have said, I want to join this Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, I want to join the WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement, but I just don't have the capacity to do it because I have to think about all of these different things. So that's what we're doing together to say, can we work knowing, using our know-how to lower those transaction costs? The second thing I will say is, you know, I think it's really interesting, this new micro-multinational, this B2C, which is package-based trade on the internet. That is great because I think it's, it's breaking down these notions that small businesses can't compete in the global economy. But B2C is actually an easier transaction than B2B if you're good, you know, if you're selling to Walmart, you need to have certain criteria versus if you're selling into just one, one package to one customer. 
So how do we take the learnings of B2C and translate those to B2B to make sure we're, you know, that I, really what creates growth and job growth is small businesses coming into global value chains, so be part of the global value chain versus package-based trade. Both good, both different, different barriers. We need to be open to all of those. But I, you know, we just bought, uh, increased our stake in a company called JD.com, and one of the things we're doing with them is taking U.S. products and shipping them to consumers in China because there, there's a desire and a thirst for, for U.S. product, for food products, for safety, for convenience, for all of these things. Boom, that's us enabling U.S. farmers, U.S. businesses, U.S. food manufacturers to get their products you know, right to the consumer in China, and that's happening more and more and more. There's actually tremendous opportunities uh, in China for U.S. businesses because uh, the Chinese are having problems and have had problems with uh, quality control for their products, so the emerging middle class in China is actively uh, using online platforms to shop for things like uh, baby products, for example, uh, both in North America and, and Europe. Australia actually had to put a limit on the amount of baby formula you could actually bring back to China in your suitcase. You'd know this, right? It's your baby formula. Is it your baby formula? No. Other questions? Um, so, see, uh, you, you know, uh, I, I'm personally interested in kind of the developing country uh, environment, and, and um, your book may have had the U.S. small businesses um, as your principal um, uh, market, but I wondered if you could sort of uh, look at how it would be relevant to uh, traders. Well, it's really relevant to any market, yeah. uh, because, of course, uh, and we haven't uh, mentioned it uh, yet, but I do have a, a long chapter on uh, government regulation of trade, uh, which has become, uh, during my professional career, very uh, harmonized uh, with uh, WTO rules and uh, rules uh, of the World Customs Organization. So um, uh, the principles in all the chapters apply, I think, to any country, and uh, when we come to government regulation, uh, because now there's a lot of uh, uh, uniformity driven by WTO agreements primarily, but also regional agreements. Um, uh, I can talk about uh, the classification and valuation of, of merchandise, for example, and the same rules apply everywhere. Uh, there, there are uh, problems with trade transaction costs in many developing countries. One of the reasons for that is that many of these countries rely on uh, customs revenue or, or revenue at, at, uh, collected at the port, or not necessarily customs uh, uh, duties, but uh, other types of taxes, VAT, and so forth, um, for their government revenue. I, I know when I was working in Kosovo a few years ago, uh, something like 78% of government revenue came from border collections. So when you have that sort of situation, it's very easy uh, for the authorities to kind of slow down imports and exports and kind of look at them and make sure uh, they're getting all the money that they're, uh, they, they should be getting. Yeah, but this is, this is uh, uh, very uh, troubling in terms of uh, trade facilitation and uh, you know, uh, efficient logistics. So there are, uh, as Sarah indicated, uh, there are, there are ways to assure revenue collection and also assure that you have uh, efficient uh, logistics. Uh, it, it's not rocket science. The methodologies exist and the technologies exist. And uh, the um, task force that, uh, or the group that Sarah is part of uh, is uh, dedicated to spreading that uh, knowledge, as you are too, I think. Right? Okay. Yeah. Stephen, thank you very much. I'm Stephen Smith with the Anderson Foundation. And you spell your name correctly. <clears throat> and I spell my name the right way. Um, I, I just want to leave, you mentioned China, I just want to tell you, I, I heard this new take recently on the expression, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And, and this is a Chinese joke. He said, well, that means if you play with your smartphone, your, your iPhone constantly, 
you will not be spending enough time earning your degree, and thus you will not get your PhD. <laughs> um, but uh, I want to segue to that in, to, uh, you know, in terms of the knowledge. Right, playing too much with a smart device. But um, the more serious question is, what do you see as the need in the field of education or, or training for people to be ready to go into to go global, global with uh, you know looking at the needs of large businesses like Walmart or even people starting out on their own? What what is the training and education experience they need in your view to succeed? They can start by, by reading my book. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, seriously. Um, you're working in a, a critical uh, sector. Uh, education uh, is going to be critical to the development of the economy in the future. And uh, um, we all tend to be uh, backward looking, I think, even uh, some educational institutions. Uh, we need to appreciate what's happening with modern technology, the, um, the advent and ramping, rapid ramping up of cross border e commerce, the importance of uh, uh, global uh, data flows to, uh, uh, that are ramping up very fast uh, to, to uh, the future of trade and to the future of the global economy. Um, WIDA uh, had a, a very interesting program, I think on the 18th, wasn't it, Ken? Um, uh, Next Trade. And uh, to me, the most interesting part of that uh, program was uh, a presentation uh, by McKinsey and the circulation of a report uh, called, I think, Global Data Flows, was it, Ken? A uh, marvelous report that uh, kind of outlines uh, the, the, uh, the, the quick development of, uh, of data flows and how it's impacting uh, international trade and the economy and how it will in the future. And by the way, the report's uh, available free online. And you may have more copies here, I don't know, of the, heart, of the print version. Uh, we don't have any with us here today. Okay. But we, yeah. yeah, but it's available uh, yes. online. Yeah, well, that, um, yeah. Yeah, we, yeah, we can probably squeak in one short, <laughs> we can get a short question here. We have about a minute left. Um, Cassandra Harden, I'm also with the Amazon Foundation. I actually had a question for Sarah. Um, I'm just reading your bio here, and I see you have this Women's Economic Empower Empowerment Initiative at Walmart. Sure. So I wanted to ask a little bit more about that, I think. A lot of the times I'm used to hearing about, um, when it comes to trade, understanding the economic power of women more on the consumer side. So I wanted to ask you about uh, the power of women and maybe your understanding the role of women in the supply side. You think? No, no. You yeah. think? Go quick. Yeah, we. All right. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> it's uh, it's actually one of the things I'm proudest of working on at Walmart. So about five years ago, we decided to make a commitment to women's economic empowerment and the incentive for it was the fact that the majority of our customers are women. Women control over 20 trillion dollars of consumer spending. So when people are going to make those choices in the supermarket, it's mostly a woman. Um, and most of our associates are women. And our theory was um, if we provide the products and services that are designed and made by women, we'll be a more relevant retailer. Um, and we'll have a better performing business. And then from a development perspective, women tend to invest more in their societies and their communities. So as we become a global retailer, um, and we've you know, rapidly moved into 28 different markets around the world, how do we make sure the ecosystems around our stores and clubs are the most vibrant economically they can be? And it's really by investing in women. Um, and I think the development community has sort of come around to recognize that you've got to have women as part of the development equation because they really are going to invest them back in their children and their communities. And so the program is really designed to think about what's the strength of Walmart. We buy a lot and we hire a lot of people. So how do we put that into the development equation? So sourcing from women of businesses and then training women both on farms and factories and then for their first retail job to make sure we're figuring out where we intersect with women and what are the things that are going to change sort of a cycle to create better economic mobility for women. So it's been fascinating. We're doing what we did is at CSAS is helping us as a knowledge partner to come and think about what we've learned over the last five years. But happily, all these crazy goals that somebody set out, we're going to probably achieve by sometime this fall, which is good. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, Stephen, I'm Sarah, thank you. Stephen, I'm very grateful uh, for your bringing this conversation to WIDA. 
Um, we get sucked up, I think, in WIDA uh, looking at larger policy issues. Uh, what, what can we do? You were talking about business to business and small business to business and consumer to business, uh, business to consumer. You know, we look at policy, we talk to policymakers, um, and that's typically our audience. But I, I, I think um, we need to be grounded in what really happens in a business transaction to actually be able to understand the policy conversation that we're trying to be a, a thought leader on, a thought leader at Echo Chamber. We're trying to amplify, have that conversation and host that conversation. It's really grateful that you came to that event um, uh, last week uh, to talk about our next gen trade initiative. Um, you know, we're finding our way in that space. Um, I, I think your book is going to help us actually pluck out issues that we need to look at, that we need to think of uh, for our, the policymakers that we interact with, whether it's in the US government or foreign governments or businesses, because if we aren't actually looking at the real way that business is being conducted on the ground between individuals and companies, how a product is going to move across borders, Sarah, with some of the things you were talking about as well, we can't actually help with it. The conversation doesn't really get us where we need to go, because we really need to understand what's happening. So. Um, I'm very grateful for your coming here we, uh, to have this conversation. I, I actually think I want to tap into you uh, more often as a resource for us as we think about uh, the things that we should be featuring and, and highlighting for policymakers uh, going forward. So thank you. I don't know if you have any last words before we wrap up. Uh, well, I uh, had a lot of fun doing this. I appreciate it. Uh, nice talking to you all and getting to know you. Uh, and some of you I've known for many years. <laughs> um, I do have uh, some copies of my book, uh, and I'll be happy to sign them uh, after the program if anyone is interested. Uh, so uh, thanks again for your attendance. It's been a lot of fun for me. Thank thanks. You.